Uh, Marie, everyone. Uh, this is our guest today, Brother Anthony. He's a monk from Silverstream uh, Monastery in Ireland. Um, they are, some of you may be familiar already with the order. They are uh, Benedictines of Perpetual Adoration. And today's show is going to be on Mother MacTilda, a Benedictine saint, uh, and on her, her teachings on the Eucharist and her role on perpetual adoration. Um, so welcome, Brother Anthony. Thanks very much for, for being here with us. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Um, so just before we, we start, um, Brother Anthony, would, would you be able to lead us uh, in an opening prayer? Oh, sure. sure. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pre nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Sancta Iosef, ora pre nobis, Our Lady of the Son, ora, pray for us. Amen. Um, just for everybody watching, um, just before we get into it, uh, please like and subscribe to our channel. Um, click the, the bell icon as well so you get updates on when we release new videos like, like these podcasts. And also please, uh, if you're interested, uh, sign up to get a delivery of our Co-Redemptrix magazine. Um, and the link, I believe, is in the description. And also you can find it on our websites. Um, on the Marian Franciscans website uh, for the Co-Redemptrix Co magazine, um, released quarterly, four times a year, on different aspects of Our Lady. And we just had uh, an edition released quite recently for the spring. Um, so, um, so Brother Anthony, this, this Saint Mother MacTilda, um, could you maybe tell us a bit about her early life uh, and the first, the first community that she joined? Sure. So, uh, Mother Mechtild, uh Catherine was her original name, uh, Catherine de Bar. Um, she was born in uh, Lorraine, so a section of France there, Alsace, Lorraine. Um, she was born into a, a fairly well-off family and was, was very well educated. Um, she received all of the kind of the basic education that a middle-class person would um, including medicine um, and uh, very pious uh, very holy even from, from an early age and uh, yeah she eventually joined she, she wanted to join a religious order her father was generally opposed um, but eventually gave in and she was resigned she just said I don't care what religious order I go to just just let me go. I, I want to give myself to God. And so uh, her father chose for her this order called the Annunciade. Uh, it's this order of the Annunciation. So they in a very colorful habit, white, uh, white, red, and blue, I believe. Um, so not, not, not quite as contemplative uh, as the Benedictine she would later, later join, but that was her initial uh, step at least. And so she was, she was given the name, uh, I think it was Sister Catherine of, of St. John the Evangelist uh, originally. So uh, yeah, that was the, at least the original order she was in. Yes, and um, also shortly after her profession, after her novitiate, um, the superior of that convent had to leave the monastery and she asked Sister uh, Saint John the Evangelist um, to replace her, and she was only tw twenty years old at the time. Sure, um, yes. which shows what yeah. maturity she must have had at such a young age to be elected superior already. Right. Um, yes, so I think she was superior for a couple of years um, at, at that young age, and then the wars, and then there was the wars um, that were causing a lot of troubles in France at the time. I don't know if you could say a little bit about these wars and then the impact it had on um, Mother Matilda in terms of sure. needing to move move convents. 
Yeah, so she, um, she, this was in the midst of the, the Thirty Years' War, uh, which ended in, in 1648. Uh, but that the last portion of it there in the 1630s or so is when it really came to France and especially into Lorraine. Lorraine was kind of semi-independent, I think, from France, if I remember correctly. And um, but this, the Swedish army was coming in, so the Protestant army, and they were uh, just kind of going from town to town. And she was forced to, to move several times. Um, and eventually she wound up there at the uh, Rambert Villet, uh, the Benedictines there, taking refuge there. And uh, yeah, but it was it was this constant movement that wherever the army was coming, they were they're constantly having to move to another location. Um, and, it, and it seems like throughout her life, uh, there were armies that either came into the convent or at the were at the convent door. It uh, seemed like a common experience of hers, unfortunately. But um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, pillaging, burning. Um, she witnessed a lot of that, just the, the death as well as desecration of, of churches and of the Eucharist yes. during that time. Yeah. yeah, so there was a lot to contend with um, because she had all these wars happening and also because of all the wars, um, there was famines and also there was, there was plagues as well. At one point around this early time within her life, she had uh, 20 sisters, I believe, that she was looking after. Um, still from i think this first community of the of the annunciation of the annunciadas mm -hmm. and then when plague broke plague broke out uh only five of them survived including um this is saint john the evangelist this is saint john the evangelist right, right. um so yes uh, so as, as you say um brother Ante, that she she moved to to Ram, rambaville and this is her first meeting with the benedictine rule the benedictine way of life Right. She's so, um, she felt very, she was so attracted by this rule, which was more austere than that of the Annunciadas, that she reflected and deliberated a lot after moving to them. And then she drew up a report, which she sent to Rome, um, asking if she could transfer basically to the Benedictines, um, right. Right. which was accepted. So then she started mm -hmm. her novitiate at, at Ramberville right. um, and took the name Sister Catherine of St. Matilda. Right. Um, um so yes she made her solemn vows um in 1640 and she was 25 years old at that time um and again because because of wars and poverty they were split up and she uh 1640 um she moved with a couple of other nuns to saint michael and um there was a lot of misery there in that region, um, so much so that Vincent de Paul, he was sending people to, uh, from Paris, he was sending people to help people in the, in the areas most in need, most poor and most misery. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the areas which he sent people to, to help, pe help the people in need. And one of his uh, delegates, should we say, um, came across Mother Matilda and really saw how destitute her and her sisters was, you know, they were haggard from the hunger. Um, that and, and their, their clothes were in tatters. So he, he arranged for them to be moved again, basically, to, to some better circumstances. Um, but even where they were moved to, they were moved to, it wasn't much better, it was a ramshackle cottage, uh, which was yeah. constantly in danger of flooding mm -hmm. from uh, rainfall, from any rainfall from the nearby stream could have basically overrun their ramshackle cottage. Right. Um, so it was quite tough conditions that her and her sisters were enduring. Mm -hmm. um, and then at this point, uh, a gentleman called Mr. de Torp uh, was walking past and saw the conditions that her and her sisters were in. And he was a part, very pious gentleman. And so he, he moved them into one of his cottages, mm -hmm. um, w which was much better for them. Um, so here, here he met Dom Quinet, and also, which was, a, who was a um, abbot of a Cistercian monastery nearby, uh, in the abbot of Barbary, I, I believe. Yes, the abbot, abbot of Barbary. 
And then also, this is where she met Jean de Berniere, who was a, a very well-known mystic of the area. Um, don't know if you could say anything about this mystic that she came across, um, Berniere. Yeah, Jean, Jean um, de uh, Bernier there, he uh, kind of like, I, I think he's sort of like the forgotten, um, at least in the English-speaking world, he's sort of forgotten among the French school of spirituality. Um, but he was kind of um, in that that group. Uh, I think they, they called this the grand century in France in terms of the spirituality of the French school. And so he was, he was part of that. Um, and yeah, very holy, a mystic. Um, he, he kind of became her spiritual advisor for quite some time. And, um, yeah, and just sort of helped her along. Um, she also, I think she, she may have met that Father John Chrysostom at the time, who was, you know, additionally, he was a Franciscan who helped her as well spiritually. Um, but yeah, yeah, Jean, Jean de Bernier there became a, you know, a lifelong friend of hers and spiritual uh, advisor from that point onwards. Yes, yes, he was, yes, he was a very holy um, layman and he was head of what was called the Hermitage, I believe, at the time. Hermitage, yeah. Which, yes, which was a kind of a, a, a retreat or spirituality center, which was very influential on a lot of the mystics of France of that century, I believe, and right, informing, yeah. informing them in the in the French school mm -hmm. spirituality. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we we just kind of did um. A brief overview of her moves of convents. There, there was up to this point. There was more. There was more convents that she moved in between. Um, she, for example, she went through Holy Trinity Convent briefly, um, and and another convent at Montmartre. Um, right. so she she had many moves to get up to this point, um, and then yes, and then she she moved to Paris. She was offered a house in Paris. Right. And this is where, as you mentioned, Father in Paris, she met she met Father Jean Chrysostom, the right. Franciscan tertiary priest, um, who became a spiritual director. Right. And he was, uh, mortification was a big, um, was a big part of his spirituality and how he he guided how he guided her. Right. And yes, apparently she wasn't too well at the time when he first took her under his care and straight away he put her on quite an intensive program of, of penance mortification yes. right right like three hours of sleep a night right um various forms of various forms of penance and fasting and stuff yes um, yeah but su surprisingly she actually she, got better quite quickly yes yeah 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 so yeah. Pe people thought he was probably inspired by the holy spirit right um right. in his advice um, so he was, he was very holy anyway, this mm -hmm. Franciscan uh, tertiary, and he died within a year. He, she only had him as for a spiritual director for one year. Right, right. Um, and then she, after, after that, she was very distraught, Mother Matilda, mm -hmm. and she asked Jean Benier uh, if he could fully overtake uh, at the role of spiritual director. Sure. Um, so, yes, and then... In 1640, around this time, when she was in, in Paris, she was elected abbess of a little Benedictine convent called Bon Secours, uh, which was not flourishing at the time. Great. And with, with her flock, through her sweetness and her ardent love and her energy and delicacy, she managed her delicacy for all her daughters. She managed to transform the community in just a few months. <laughs> and... She was with that community for three years. Um, and then she was elected as prioress of uh, Ramberville, which mm -hmm. was the Benedictine monastery she originally came into contact with the Benedictine rule through. Um, and she went there and again, it was completely ravaged um, by the war between the French and the Spanish, the area and people in the area were almost in despair. And sometimes people would flee to the convent to escape the blows of the soldiers. Um, so it was, it was a very rough area at the time and dangerous. Um, she wanted at that time 
just to be forgotten in some unknown monastery. But her spiritual director, uh, Bernier, uh, said she should go to Paris to secure a living for her dispersed flock because they were still scattered around in different monasteries due to the poverty and the wars and everything. Um, so she so she went to Paris. Um, and then when she went to Paris, she became acquainted with, my French pronunciation is not too good, but Madame de Chateauvieux. Yeah, the Countess. Chateauvieux, yeah. Yes. The Countess. I don't know if you mm -hmm. say a little bit, uh, brother, about about this meeting with, with the Countess and how providential that was to turn out. Yeah, she, uh, so yeah, the Countess came to uh, where she was staying there, uh, the convent, at some point uh, with another woman of nobility, I believe. And uh, I think the initial meeting, she was very impressed at the Countess. And so she, um, she left and, and then came back. And when she was there the second time, uh, she kind of asked a number of the nuns, including Mother MacTilde, about prayer, she just saying, I'm, I'm having trouble in prayer. And Mother MacTilde didn't say anything, just keeping, keeping quiet. And eventually the Countess uh, Chateauvieux there said, oh, Mother, what, do you have anything to say? Um, and so she said a, a few words, whatever it was she said was very short and it kind of uh, cut her to the heart there, the, the Countess. And so she instantly um, you know, was cured of whatever troubles she was having in prayer and recognizing Mother MacTill was a uh, very deep, very holy woman. So after that, she started this relationship with her, sort of writing and visiting her and uh, being a patroness and ended up becoming um, kind of the, one of the biggest helps in getting the convent started there. Um, the Benedictines of Perpetual Adoration when they, when they did uh, decide to found that. So. And then um, she, uh, it's actually the, the, uh, the contents of a, a book that we, we helped publish there, The Breviary of Fire, uh, this book called The Breviary of Fire that uh, helped put together. And that is basically just letters between Mother MacTilde and the Countess. So um, a lot of uh, rich spiritual teaching was in there. Um, and I, I think the Countess may have, um, I don't remember the exact details, but I, I believe she tried to join uh, after her husband died, join the okay. convent in some capacity. So. All right. Yes, I didn't realize that she tried to join. Um, yeah, so around this time that she became her spiritual director, Mother MacTilda became the spiritual director of the Countess. Mm -hmm. uh, Mother MacTilda was receiving many offers from different monasteries to become uh, abbess or superior of their convents. Right. And so the Countess was quite worried because she she was worried that she would lose her uh, and she would that Mother Matilda would leave Paris and she wouldn't be able to really be her spiritual director anymore. She wouldn't be able to see her regularly. So this is when the Countess said to Mother Matilda, suggested to her, you know, why don't you found a, a religious house here and we, right. you, you gather all your sisters, all, like all the dispersed sisters to be here in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, she was saying partly because she, she didn't want to lose her personally as a spiritual right. director, but that, that turned out to be quite providential because the Countess had many connections with mm -hmm. rich, uh, rich Catholic people right. um, who signed up uh, to help support the founding of this convent for all the funds that were necessary. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, it, so Mother MacTilda agreed to the Countess's suggestion and they, they founded this convent in Paris of Perpetual Adoration. And initially, the Countess was trying to convince Mother MacTilda to be superior, and Mother MacTilda was, was resisting. So then the Countess was calling different confessors to talk to Mother MacTilda to convince her, and she was still not, not yielding. So then eventually she called in the bishop uh, to talk to Mother MacTilda, and then after the bishop talked to her, she eventually, eventually yielded and agreed to become the, the superior of, of the convent. Um, so yes, this, as you mentioned, uh, brother, this was a convent of perpetual adoration. Um, so could you say a little bit about the, the Eucharistic origins of this of this house? 
uh, with you know factors around France at the time, for example, that contributed to this uh, taking place and being being founded. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, Mother MacTilde, at least on a personal level, had always been devoted to the Eucharist, even from her childhood. Um, um, but I mean, at the time, of course, uh, the wars, uh, especially these armies, any any time the you know the army came in, they'd ransack the church. The Eucharist would uh, would uh, inevitably be desecrated, thrown, uh, fed to animals, um, trampled upon. Mother MacTilde, uh, you know, witnessed this firsthand, um, and there was sort of a. Um, uh, a fervor of Eucharistic um, piety at the time, um, and which is understandable. I mean, the Holy Spirit probably was, was stirring this up um, in response to you know, what was going on, just to bring people back to the Eucharistic faith. Um, and so, yeah, Mother MacTilde had always had this uh, sort of this, this uh, bend or disposition towards the Eucharist. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Mother MacTilde in, in Paris, I mean, the Countess of Chateauvieux helped her. Um, uh, actually, the Queen, uh, Queen Mother there, the mother of, of uh, King Louis the Fourteenth, um, she liked to make vows sometimes, like bargain with God a little bit, like say, you know, if, uh, Lord, if you um, if you lessen this violence or whatever's going on in the city, um, then I'll build a chapel or something like that. So she had uh, one of the Sulpician priests make this vow for her that um, at the time there was something called the Fronde that was going on in Paris, just a lot of violence. And she said, if you take care of this, I'll, I'll form this convent of nuns of perpetual adoration. Um, so that that was also a, a factor because afterwards this Sulpician priest found Mother MacTilde and that was kind of also part part of the story as well, um, but uh, but yeah, it, it uh, a little bit of Mother MacTilde's own Eucharistic piety as well as just the um, you know the, the need for reparation and adoration in, in light of um, the desecration of the Eucharist at the time, um, as well as just this Eucharistic fervor seemed to be kind of uh, the Holy Spirit stirring that up in, in the hearts of everyone at the time. Yes, yes, and um, as well as reparation, as you mentioned, um, for the atrocities that were happening due to the wars and the soldiers mm -hmm. against the Eucharist. Also, there were many uh, magicians and sorcerers at the time yeah, who were yeah, unfortunately yeah. making sacri sacrileges against the Eucharist. So it was in response uh, and reparation to that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and also it was a response, a uh, reaction as well to the Calvinists of the time who denied the real presence. Um, yeah who were prevalent in France. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, yes, uh, the Queen Anne of Austria, her intervention was, was key because initially from the, the abbot who was kind of in charge of the area at the time, he was in charge of, he could, he could give the go ahead or, or say no to any convents being founded for that area. He initially resisted, but then once, as you, as you mentioned, once uh, Queen Anne of Austria intervened through that, because of that vow, then then, then, then you know the green light opened, and and they founded the convent. Right. right. Um, okay. So after she founded this first convent, mm -hmm. that was the beginning of a series, a series of convents being opened. Right. Uh, don't know if you could say a little bit about how 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 much a bit like Teresa of Avila, you know, things really flourished for her in terms of opening many convents after that. Right, yeah, she um, she was constantly moving around, which she didn't like. Um, and she certainly just uh, desired the, the stability, the Benedictine stability there. Um, but yeah, she she had a dream at some point. I don't remember all the, the details of it, but she had a dream of seven monstrances um, set up in, in various locations or countries. Um, that ended up being a prophetic dream. So she ended up setting up, by the end of her life, seven new convents, 
Um, and I think there are a couple others as well that she just brought into or aggregated into the, mm. the community, um, the seven new ones at least. And she saw it at the end of her life that um, that was this, this dream that she had, uh, that each of those convents was like a monstrance in whatever location it was in. Um, and so, yeah, she uh, was constantly traveling some of them were in France, some were over in, in Lorraine, her home, home area. Uh, one was in Warsaw, which was actually um, a, uh, the one in Warsaw, it's still there today. It's, it, that was founded in response to the, the victory of, of Jan Sobieski, um, the, the Battle of Vienna. Okay. So, but yeah, con constantly getting uprooted and traveling. And um, I think at one point she said, you know, in order to found a new convent, there's, there's so much suffering, but yes. um, the consolation of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament is my, my refuge. Right. So. Yes, she was, I think she said, yeah, her refuge and more than made up for any suffering entailed in, right. in founding the convent. Um, and in this founding of the religious houses um, and the expansion of the order of the sisters, the nuns of perpetual, adoration could you talk any a little bit about you know her human qualities and also the intensity of her t interior life which enabled all of this to happen and enabled her to be uh, loved uh, so much by her communities and to be so effective um with founding the convents and with all her spiritual daughters right right yeah, even even back when she was with the the Annunciator, it was recognized that she had um, the ability to to lead um, in terms of you know being a mother superioress, um, and so she was constantly being called upon to be an abbess. They were constantly inviting her. Like, various people, uh, nobility and whatnot, were constantly trying to to make her an abbess of of their their, their convent, wherever they were. Um, and so she, she had these qualities that, I mean, even from an early age, she was um, just so well educated, um, her family background, um, but as well as just uh, um, a lot of the, a lot of the brothers here will joke sometimes because in her writings, sometimes she seems very ascetic and saying mm. um, she was big on uh, in the French school. They had this idea of, uh, uh, if I pronounce it right, this in nothing meant mm. um, that I need to empty myself, become nothing, so that I may be filled with, with Christ. We need to empty ourselves. So this constant emptying. Um, but then on the other hand, she'll have these these very consoling uh, things to her daughter, saying, you know, you know, don't worry about your faults. Um, you're fine. Um, kind of this this very motherly side to her as well, and so. She, she did a very good job of balancing those two, being very ascetic, as well as, well as very having this, this sort of soft side or compassionate motherly side as well. Um, so that, that really um, aided her. And just, I think just in general, just a very good um, administrator on sort of the practical level. Um, her, her unbreakable trust in divine providence as well is mm -hmm. such a big part of her ability to lead constantly just abandoning herself to, to God's designs and not worrying um, really about the snags and the, the crosses that, that came. Yes, exactly. Which, I mean, she needed that, she needed that abandonment to divine providence. Um, especially that was so visible in the early years when she was from all the wars, moving to convent to convent and the plagues and she was always abandoned to God, trusting and trying to be as faithful to the rule as possible, no matter what the conditions they were in. Right. Um, it's quite incredible. Um, so she had a big love for Our Lady. Sure. Uh, I don't know if you could say anything anything about that, like she, uh, entrusting the sisters and the convents to Our Lady. And Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, the kind, I mean, even when she was a little, uh, when she was a child, her mother died just saying, you know, blessed mother, I take you as my mother. Um, I'm lost. You know, I, I have nothing. You be my mother. Um, and then throughout, the, you know, 
a lot of the wars and whatnot, constantly calling on Our Lady for help when the armies were coming in. Um, and then, yeah, when, once she founded her, her convent there, Perpetual Adoration, she said, um, there will be no abbess here except for Our Lady. Mm. So you will only have a prioress. Um, so even to this day, her convents only have a prioress uh, that's elected every few years. And the abbess is Our Lady. And they even went to the extent of having a place for Our Lady in the refectory. And so they had a plate for her and they would serve food on that plate as if they uh. were serving Our Lady. And then after the meal, uh, that plate would be given to the poor. Right, okay. Um, so uh, they had a statue or an image of Our Lady in every uh, main part of the, the convent that had Our Lady with the, the crozier. So the, the heavenly abbots. So, uh, so very much, uh, she took it very seriously that, that Our Lady was the abbess and uh, constantly telling uh, her sisters there to, to consecrate themselves and to Our Lady. So, yes, it's a very nice touch about serving our serving Our Lady at every meal. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah, every meal. I'm not come across that before. But. Um, okay, so in terms of her. She wrote a lot uh, in her letters, as you mentioned. She had uh, a book that you that uh, the Silver Stream have published. Her letters between her and the Countess. Uh, she's she was prolific in terms of her letters. I think she wrote over ten thousand letters of correspondence, um, and in these letters, they're in, you know heavily Im imbued with her love of the Eucharist, um, which, if anyone is is interested, um, Silver Stream. What was the name of the, of the book you said uh, of the letters between? The letter and... says uh, the bravery of fire. Bravery of uh, fire. The, the bravery of fire. Yes. Okay. And then also there's a mystery of incomprehensible love, uh, which goes through her teachings of different aspects of the Eucharist, as found in her letters and her conferences to her sisters. And then at the end is a uh, an account of her life. Really, um, it's a very beautiful book. Um, also published and released by the Silver Stream. Um, Silver Stream Brothers. So these, these would be available. Is it on? Is it called the Chenacol website? Yeah, the um, Senecal Senecal OSB uh, Silver Stream Priory website. Um, if you Google Silver Stream Priory, it'll it'll come up. Yeah, it should it should come up. Um, so yeah, right on our website there, you can. It's an online store. Okay. Um, so in terms of her teachings. On the Eucharist, um, I don't know if you'd be able to say anything about directly about her direct teachings. For example, perhaps on adoration, her teachings on adoration, or her teachings on the virtues that we can draw from Christ through the Eucharist. Right, right. Yeah. So she, uh, being part of the, the French school, there uh, this, this this is a big thing in the French school. The, the states of Christ's life. Um, so he, Christ lived his whole life um, in this world and in time, um, and that is now past. But the uh, this idea that um, his experiences of everything from the moment of his conception till ascension into heaven is still in his soul. Like you know, those are experiences that are in the soul of Christ, um, that are in God. And, He's a divine person. He experienced all of these things as a divine person. And so, yeah, the French school is, is all about um, this idea that he can communicate now those virtues from all of those moments in his life, his infancy, his, his passion, um, whatever, to us. And so, Mother MacTilde, will, she'll talk about the states of, of the Eucharist specifically, saying, Okay, you know, our Lord is here present in the most blessed sacrament. Um, and, and that means he is present at, at all of his different states, all of his different um, moments of his life are there before us. Um, and, uh, but most, most especially, she talked about uh, the victimhood of Christ in the Eucharist. Um, and she, she actually, she drew up um, a list of 24 states that she she uh, talked about um, 
of Christ in the Eucharist. So it, there's this list of 24, um, obviously not, not an exhaustive list since, since God is, is infinite, but um, this list, uh, I don't remember all of them, but some of them were like, uh, you know, Christ is uh, a servant in the Eucharist. Um, he is like the immolated victim um, offering himself for sinners in, in the host, or he is he's silent in the host, he's unknown and exiled from his, his own land in the host. Uh, he's, he's not recognized, he is powerless there. Um, he, is, he is though dead, um, which he uh, would, would talk about a little bit. Uh, St. Paul is saying every time we, we celebrate the Eucharist, we proclaim the death of the Lord. Um, so she would, she would talk about that as being one of his states. Um, and so she, yeah, she had this list of 24 states of, of our Lord in the Eucharist and, and told her daughters, you know, every one of you is called to really emulate one of these, um, that, that God prepares all of our souls to emulate one of these states him in the Eucharist there in the, in the most blessed sacrament. But yeah, she was, she was very big on, on making herself and, and the daughters there, making themselves victims along with our Lord in the, the host, the Lord being offered in the unbloody manner there in the holy sacrifice of the mass. Um, so joining him there um, at, as a, a victim offering ourselves as well. And yes, yeah, so that, that was sort of, she was, she was big on that. Um, and that was kind of part of her, her making reparation, you know, ad, adoring her Lord, making reparation by offering herself um, as a victim along with the, the sacred host. So, yeah. Yes. And what you were saying um, about Jesus being in his victimhood in, in the Eucharist, that makes me think of this term that I often heard in her writings of in nothingment, uh, which you mentioned as well. And, and just, for example, there's a quote from her saying, may Jesus in nothing in his divine sacrament, bring about in us the perfection of holy and complete in nothingment. Um, so I guess that, that ties in with the victimhood and being emptied out and f filled with Christ. Um, and so as ador also adoration, um, she spoke a lot about adoration, uh, the value of adoration with our Lord. Um, for example, well, this, this, this is an example here, a quote of how he's present in all his different states, as you mentioned in the Eucharist. She says, strive, my dear daughter, to love this adorable child who is nothing but love and who loves you with an infinite love. Ask the most holy mother of God to give you her love with which to love him in the manger and in the most holy sacrament of the altar. So I guess she's, she's talking about how he's present in his childhood and infancy as well. Right. The Eucharist. right, right. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, this is, oh yeah, then just maybe one more quote, um, which I found quite interesting. She says, after receiving communion, he should be our tongue for praising, blessing, exalting, adoring, and thanking his Father, and in the same way, our heart for loving him. Jesus Christ does everything in a soul who allows him to act. The secret is to remain in him, striving not to leave him. And that really struck me. Um, as you're saying, when, when we, we, we spend time with Christ in the Eucharist and we receive him in Holy Communion, and it becomes him in us, uh, right. praising, blessing, adoring. Mm -hmm. um, she was very keen, wasn't she also, Brother Anthony, on uh, very frequent Holy Communion, which was went quite against yeah. the, the grain of the time. Right, right, right. Yeah, she, um, well, I think uh, it may have been the Father John Chrysostom who, who told her to receive every day, um, which, I mean, up until, you know, mid-20th century or so, um, yeah, people were, were very cautious about receiving communion uh, they wouldn't receive very often, uh, especially before you know, Pius X there. That, that, uh, um, people could easily fall into kind of an overly cautious state. You know, they, 
they might only receive the Eucharist uh, once per year. Um, and then, or, you know, if you are religious, maybe you know, once a month or once a week. Um, so that you know, once a week was kind of the max almost. Um, and so Mother McTilde, yeah, I, I think it, at some point at least she was receiving every day. Um, I don't know if, how long she was doing that, maybe, you know, but yeah, one of her spiritual advisors told her to receive every day. And there, I think there was a quote of her saying, um, I don't know how long I can sustain this, uh, just because of the time. You know, there's there's just so cautious. You know, this is our Lord. Um, I need to be prepared to receive Him. Um, it might might be a little bit tough for us today. I mean, I guess we're dealing with sort of the opposite problem today. Um, uh, but but yeah, at the time it was um, very exceptional. I mean, daily communion was almost unheard of. Time. Right. Yes, and so she was really ahead of her time, really. Um, and then once she got advised by a spiritual director to receive every day, then she would start giving that advice out as well um, in a lot of her letters. Um, for example, she was saying to Mother Placid, Mother St. Placid, Dearest, this will be a single little word for your retreat. You must receive communion every day. Um, and she, she said in her conferences as well, probably to her spiritual daughters, it is astonishing to see the goodness of a God always ready to give himself every time we desire to receive communion. He never refuses. Go to communion every day. He will come. So, um, so um, is her impact of Mother Matilda still visible now? Um, for example, in Benedictine communities, of perpetual adoration. Sure. Yeah. It's um, so well. Certainly, in our, uh, our monastery here, um, we're, we uh, we don't we don't know. I don't know how how much we're in contact with some of the, the sisters. Uh, we do know uh, there's the convent in the Netherlands that we're, we're pretty close to, um, and so they uh, yeah they still have perpetual adoration there. Um, uh, in the Netherlands, and uh, they've had that, they've had perpetual exposition and adoration, I think, since 1870 or so. Wow. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the convent in Warsaw is still uh, quite active. And, uh, convent, convent in Warsaw had some very holy souls there. Mm. Uh, there were a number of sisters who um, were killed in, in the Second World War. Um, and there's, uh, there's another. Uh, sister there, who I think is a servant of God, right. she lives uh, after the war. But, but yeah, I mean, I think in general, some some of her convents are very, uh, very much imbued with her spirit. Um, certainly, you know, here at, at Silver Stream, we're trying to, uh, um, you know, uh, live out her, her spirituality. Um. So, you're talking about how Silver Stream try and live. Uh, spirituality if you were to summarize a little bit explain a little bit how would you describe the spirituality the way of life of the the monks at silver stream so we are uh, uh, we're very you know, we're certainly benedictine follow the, the rule of saint benedict um uh, we also follow uh, you know, mother mechthild who's considered like a you know, heavenly mother here for us so um so yeah we uh we call ourselves monks of perpetual adoration. Um, uh, right now, we uh, we don't have adoration around the clock yet, uh, although that it would be the goal eventually to have twenty four seven adoration. Um, um, for now, at least, uh, you know, we have solemn exposition at least after a conventional mass uh, until uh, nine p.m. Um, and then there's a couple days a week, Thursday nights, we'll, we'll go overnight uh, into Friday. Um, and then we'll have these sort of these triduums of, of adoration. Um, so yeah, very much trying to, to live out uh, that, te that teaching of Mother Mechthild of, of being perpetual adorers, um, which I mean, Mother Mechthild also taught even when we're, we're not in front of the most blessed sacrament, uh, our Lord is within us. Uh, any soul that's in a state of grace, our Lord is, is there, present, the Holy Trinity. 
Uh, we can adore him there. And so even when we're, we're outside working or wherever we are, just constantly striving to uh, adore him wherever, wherever he is, um, to have that perpetual adore, adores. Um, and also just uh, the idea of reparation. So our monastery is very much, um, our, our whole charism there is to, to adore our Lord, uh, especially in reparation for the sins against the Most Blessed Sacrament, as well as uh, for the sins of priests, um, and as well as uh, praying for priests. So that, that might be um, kind of an added uh, part of our charism. Um, in addition to what Mother McTill taught, this is prayer for priests and reparation for the sins of priests. Um, this is very much a, a part, of, part of our charism as well. Yes, and I believe as part of that, you also offer, for example, retreats for priests, and priests will, can go to the stream for a spiritual renewal. Right, yeah, yeah, that's our, our whole goal there. We have our, our um, guest house. Um, so yeah, we, we house uh, a number of priests there. Uh, we don't we don't give preached retreats at least, but um, we try to our, our guest house is really geared towards um, having priests come and just uh, yeah, experience spiritual renewal uh, through the the choral celebration of the divine office, um, as well as Eucharistic adoration mm -hmm. um, and Holy Mass. So uh, yeah, that's really. Um, yeah, and we're we're still still a little bit in our beginning stages here, but but yeah, we're trying to really um, have that hospitality towards priests, most especially, and just offer um, offer this this place as a, a space of a spiritual renewal for them. Yeah. It's a beautiful beautiful apostolate, um, so much needed now, yeah, um, with all the pressures and uh, that the priests are undergoing now. Um, and uh, I was curious: Is Tyburn is Tyburn part of the same family of Mother Matilda because of their perpetual adoration, or is it different a different family? No, Benedict. so Tyburn uh, Tyburn is a different family. I don't I don't remember the exact history of them. But, okay. Um, yeah, so they're not connected with Mother Matilda's. Right. Mother, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've got, I've got a couple of more questions, uh, but I'll just ask a few questions from the audience first before my last two questions. Um, so, right. So the first question, well, it's more a comment really from Alison. Thank you so much with the tragic decline in faith in the tr true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, it's so important to focus on saints who loved and adored him in the Holy Sacrament. Yes, yeah, thank you, Alison. That's, that's very true. For example, with Mother, Mother Matilda. Um, okay, so so we have here another comment, Survivor, from Survivor. This podcast has God's timing for me. Please, everyone, go and read the book in Sinu Jizu. Um, so in Sinu Jizu, that was. I believe uh, released from Silver Stream, right. um, and very yeah, it's very beautiful uh, messages there from our Lord and meditations uh, on Christ's presence in the Eucharist. I, I agree with survivors; very 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 beautiful. Um, so if anyone hasn't come across it, highly recommended um, for entering into the mystery of Christ in the Eucharist. Um, so we have here a comment from. Radio Maculata in question. Ava Maria, Brother Anthony, great to have you on the show. Could you please tell us about how you corresponded with your vocation to monastic life? Sure. Is that just how I came? You mean like how I came to, to monastic life? Or? I think, I believe, I imagine that they mean probably yes, what, how the call came about. How call. Thing, sure. How you, yeah. answered, how you answered it. Sure. Yeah. So I was. Uh, I, I was a, a parish priest uh, before this um, uh, in the United States there, and um, uh, I was ordained in, in 2017. And um, it was around that time that, that somebody had given me the book in Sinu Yezu, actually. So, and, and I had been reading it, and uh, 
yeah, it, it deeply affected me and um, began just, yeah, just spending as much time as I could before our Lord and the Most Blessed Sacrament. And um, eventually uh, discovered Silver Stream Priory and was kind of reading about them and uh, felt very, very drawn uh, to them. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think uh, you know, those first couple of years of, of priesthood, just uh, really after reading in Sinuiezu and reading about Silver Stream Priory and uh, sort of being impressed by their, their charism and their mission to adore our Lord, as well as just this prayer for priests. Um, and, uh, you know, really again, in Sinuiezu, the, the call for um, you know, priests to, to adore in the, the most blessed sacrament uh, it's really something that yeah just deeply affected me and, um, mm -hmm. and eventually I, I i wound up here through <laughs> the uh, divine providence you know Thanks for God. Here yeah. could i ask what year uh, how many years into your into your priesthood did you then transfer over to uh silver stream it was uh five years so i have, uh, it was 2022 that i I uh, arrived here. I had been here to visit before you know, a few years previous, but uh, yeah, so it's five years in the, the parish there and then came to, came to the monastery after. And because you've, you've got quite an interesting, interesting story because you've been a diocesan priest and now yeah. you're um, a monk of perpetual adoration of Benedictine. And the whole kind of theme of Insinu Jesu is, Jesu is, how important it is for priests to be utterly centered on the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And if you maybe say a few words on how important it is for spiritual health and strength of priests, especially diocesan priests who don't really have the support network, should we say, of, of a religious brother um, right. like yourself or, or myself. Mm -hmm. um, if you could say a bit about how, how necessary it is for a diocesan priest to be utterly centered on Christ in the Eucharist. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, it's uh... Really, yeah, it has to be the center of the, the priest's life. There, um, you know, our Lord in the, the the Garden of Gethsemane. There, you know, traditionally we believe that his apostles were ordained at the the last supper, ordained priests and bishops, the first bishops, and um, but the first order that he gave them was, um, "Stay here and watch with me." And you know, can you can you not stay awake with me and watch and keep vigil for an hour? Mm. Um, so that, that was the very first thing that he he told them was you know, stay here and, and be with me. Um, and so yeah, the priests are called to, to be with our Lord, in, uh, most especially in His presence there, the most blessed sacrament. And, I mean, every day we celebrate Mass, you know, our mm -hmm. Lord. It's coming down into uh, our hands, literally, um, holding him there. And, um, you know, we should be as close as we can, emulating him there in the, the sacred host. Uh, we often say that the, at the priest's command, really, the, our Lord you know, makes bread into his body, blood, soul, and divinity, um, and that he's, he's utterly dependent on on the priest there, the priest to lift him up in the host. Um, our Lord doesn't speak uh, like in his passion or in his infancy, he's silent, um, just like he is before us there on the, on the altar. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's uh, so important that the priest just be with our Lord, as he said in the garden, you know, be with me. And, and that's enough, I mean, just even, even without words, just, just being before him. Yes. Thank you very much for that. Um, and what you mentioned there about, will you not be with he, be with me for one hour, spend one hour with me, Venerable Fulton Sheen, he was very big on the daily holy hour and he says he was, because he was faithful to that daily holy hour for 50 years since the day of his ordination, that's what gave him all his fruitfulness in preaching. Yeah. And, and he was, uh, I believe as, as yourself, he was referring to that that request of our Lord, will you not be with me one hour, as a request to us, and especially priests, to spend a holy hour with him, mm -hmm. um, like in the Eucharist. Um, okay, so the next comment from Sandy, um, Ave Maria Sandy, she was saying, she was 
as in Mother Matilda. She was Saint Gertrude's sister, from what I understand. Wasn't that another Matilda, Brother Anthony? There's, there's a yeah, there's a Saint Matilda or Matilda, right. Matilda's, um, and Saint Gertrude. Um, so they they were in the Middle Ages. They were right. in the centuries before. Yeah. So yeah, Mother Matilda would have taken her name from um, Mother Matilda. We we think she's venerable. She was her cause for canonization. I think started before the de the, the designation servant of God. So. Um, at least we, we call her venerable, her venerable mother. Yes. Um, so just a comment from Marco Fazzoli. Uh, Ave Maria, Fra Joseph, Therese, and Brother Anthony, and greetings to all the friars in Dundee and Portsmouth. Thank you. Ave Maria, Marco. Um, so the next question from Radio Macalata again. Uh, how can we best make reparation for the sacrileges committed against our Lord in the Eucharist? Can you suggest any specific prayer or method? I think, uh, well, the, the best thing I think is simply um, any time you can spend with him in adoration, um, as well as just receiving him as worthily as we, we can. Um, so, I mean, the, the Sacred Heart devotion is all about just receiving him on the first Fridays. Um, and so that, that alone, at least you know, I was told to St. Margaret Mary that um, was pleasing to our Lord to, to receive him um, in a state of grace and really receiving him in communion out of, out of love for him. Um, he wants to, to join himself to us. So yeah, I mean, communions of reparation, even just making that intention saying, you know, Lord, I intend to receive this uh, communion and reparation for any sacrament that is committed against you here. Um, as well as just yeah, adoring him anywhere we can, um, even if we, we can't. I mean, just making the sign of the cross as we go in front of a church, even. I mean, that just acknowledging him there as best we can, and um, even just five minutes before him in a church in the tabernacle is, is better than, than nothing if, we, if we're short on time. Yes. Thank you. Um, but Anthony P says there's a compilation uh, of Mother Matilda's writings called The Mystery of in, uh, Incomprehensible Love, I believe is it's called, published by the Angelico Press. Uh, I believe that's, is the, is the Angelico Press the name of your publishers? That's, uh, so we, we started our own, pub Angel we've published a lot through Angelico. Okay. Um, so that's what that, that book is published through Angelico. Yeah, we started okay. our own recently. But, yeah. Okay. Um, so a question from Marco Fazzoli is, what would you say is St. Matilda's greatest spiritual legacy? Oh, I think... Uh, I think, well, her, one of her last comments, I think, towards her, her death was... I adore and I submit. Um, I adore and I submit. So just this uh, you know, constant adoration, doing doing now what you will do in heaven, which is you know, adore, adore our Lord, um, and then submitting, you know, saying I submit, just abandoning herself to divine providence. Um, and really, I think, yeah, in, in that, that statement, I adore and I submit is, really her imitation of our Lord in the host, um, her imitating him, becoming like him in the host, his, his humility, his silence, um, his offering of himself, uh, imitation of our Lord's uh, virtues there in the, the most blessed sacrament. Okay, thank you. Yes. The next, uh, Joe says, thank, thank you, Anthony. Uh, Ave Maria, Joe. Um, and another question from Radio Maculata. Can you please offer some advice on how to make our Holy Communions more fruitful? Uh, how to spend time in thanksgiving with our Lord in the most reverent way possible? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say, I mean, yeah, the thanksgiving after receiving Holy Communion is, is important. I mean, I think I've heard that so other priests would say that the most blessed sacrament remains in us for a 
few minutes there before um, you know dissolving in our in our system naturally. And so there, there are these precious moments after we receive our Lord, you know, our, our soul there is kind of exposed to his, his presence there within us. Um, and just meditating on that, being with him um, as much as possible in those those moments, the 10 minutes or so, even 10, 15 minutes after Holy Communion. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, just important to, to recognize his presence within us and adore him while he's within us. I mean, we become living tabernacles, really, just you know, in that time when we receive him. Um, and so recognizing that, telling him we, we love him there within us, adoring him within us, um, you know, thanking him um, in the, those, those moments, I suppose, after receiving him, um, yeah, it's really kind of a key, key thing. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Uh, so Gary, Gary Aldwell of Maria, he says, uh, bless you all at Silverstream. Um, Heidi says, Ave Maria, Heidi, I'm reading uh, Insino Yezu now. Um, thanks be to God. It's a beautiful book. Um, so, <clears throat> comment here to Jesus through Mary. I have the book. I gave mine to a young guy who at that time, discerning for priesthood, then a friend gave one to me. I never realized that the book is meant not only for the priests, but for all. Yes, yeah, exactly, for everyone, everyone's really relationship with Christ in the Eucharist. Um, so here we have a question. Ave Maria, Brother Anthony. Um, please, could you share what was your, the reaction of your bishop when you told him that you would like to, to join the monastery? Um, well, understandably, uh, there, are, there aren't many priests today, so it was, yeah, it was kind of tough to... You know, and any bishop, I suppose, to, to let a priest go. Um, so yeah, it was. Um, I think, yeah, the bishop now. Well, there was, there was a retired bishop. There's a current bishop. Um, you know, I think both ultimately were very open to me coming here, um, even though you know initially they, they may have been kind of reluctant. Uh, but you know, understandably so. Yeah, you know, it's just you know the shortage of priests. Um, and I suppose, uh, you know, by divine providence, I mean, I was in the, the parish there a few years, um, you know, that experience, you know, God willed that I, I be there um, at least for, for a couple of years um, for, for whatever his designs are. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the bishop, when he let me go, he's, he said, you know, I do believe the, the Holy Spirit's work here. Um, so, you know, so, you know, Deo grazie, Esther. My bishop there at home, I yeah, I pray for him all the time. I know he's praying for me as well. So, yeah. Thanks be to God. Um, and then Nicola Fazoli, um, Ave Maria Nicola. Um, and then Stuart says blessings to all. Ave Maria. Um, Ave Maria Stuart. And then Gary, I would like to invite all to support Silverstream Priory in prayers. And to assist the monastery to grow, Deo gracias. Um, so, I just had a couple of final questions myself. Um, so, could you say anything about Our Lady's role and importance for us in in our relationship with Christ in the Eucharist? So, yeah, Mother McTilde said, you know, Our Lady brought our Lord into the world, um, and it's our Lord that's in the Eucharist there, and so. In some way, she is, you know, obviously intimately connected to our Lord in the, the most blessed sacrament. And, um, you know, I like to, to meditate on that a little bit. I mean, just, I don't know how, but some, in some way, you know, Our Lady must be at work in, um, you know, bringing him to us uh, at the altar. You know, I, I'm not a, a theologian. I don't, I don't know how exactly that would work, but, um, you know, our Lord chose to come into the world through his mother, and so um, she must have a, you know, a very active role there, even at Mass and in the Most Blessed Sacrament. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in, in her, 
you know, Our Lady as, as a door as well, you know, adoring our Lord uh, throughout his hidden life, especially um, there in, in the home of Nazareth. Yeah. Yes. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> and because our, our order is, uh, has a, we have a big focus on Our Lady as her role as co-redemptrix, you know, uh, with Christ, uh, the Redeemer. And I'm wondering, what, what are your thoughts on Mary uh, under this title as co-redemptrix? Oh, well, I, you know, I certainly, yeah, I certainly call her co-redemptrix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even, I mean, every single one of us are called to offer our, our sufferings with Christ. I and mean, St. Paul um, said, you know, I'm filling up what was lacking in Christ. Um, not, not that anything really was lacking, but just, you know, in saying um, the, the sufferings of Christ that we participate in, sufferings, and um, every single one of us are called to do that. The great saints um, and those who offer themselves merited and, and can merit, and even now any of us can merit um, the conversion of others through our sufferings and whatnot, and how much more did Our Lady do that? Um, and especially, uh, you think of Mary as the second Eve, you know, um, you know, the church fathers talk about, right, you have the, the tree, you have Eve, you have Adam, the woman, the man, and the tree, and then at, at our salvation, you have Christ, the second Adam, the tree, which is the cross, and then Eve, the uh, second Eve is Mary. Um, so if, you know, if Eve was, uh, it was through Eve that, that sin entered the world, um, and that, that original sin will affect every person until the very last person in this world. Um, wouldn't second Eve um, have to undo all of that from, from the very beginning until the end you know, to be able to offer her suffering and to merit uh, the salvation of all uh, by participation um, in Christ's cross? You know, yeah, obviously we're, all, we're always, you know, Christ, Christ alone won, won the victory, but Our Lady participated in that um, to the extent that she, you know, won, you know, through participation, merited um, all of those graces for us, for our salvation. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for having um, come on the show and to, to speak about Mother Matilda and the Eucharist. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, could you um, possibly lead us in the Angelus? Oh, sure. uh, sorry, sorry, the Regina. The Regina. Oh, yes. oh sure. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really something. Regina, Chain, Letari, Alleluia. We are the Medivisti Portali, Alleluia. Resurrexit, Sigut, Dixit, Alleluia. Ora pro nobis Deo, Alleluia. Yeah. Gaure et Natale Virgo Maria, Alleluia. Quia selexit Dominus Deo, Alleluia. Alleluia. And thank you very much. And could you possibly uh, just finish with a, a final blessing for all the viewers? Oh, sure. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti, Descendat Super Vos et Maria Semper. Amen. Okay, thank you very much, Brother Anthony. Oh, thank um, you. Thank you so much for having me on. Okay. Yes. God okay, bless you. God bless. Ave Maria. Ave Maria. Yeah.